Okay. All right. Uh, greetings, everybody. My name is Eli Lehrer. I'm the president of the Arshtrit Institute. It's my honor and my privilege to introduce our speaker today to you, Virginia Pastrell. It's a particular honor because she's one of the people who's had the greatest intellectual influence on me and on our state. As the editor who brought it into the mainstream, Virginia turned Reason Magazine into an interesting but rather fringe publication to one of the first journals ever to really have a libertarian influence on the broader, on the broader public. She's also a kidney donor, a keen watcher of cultural trends, and one of the top classical liberal thinkers around today. Her first book, The Future and Its Enemies, sets up what I think is a pretty brilliant dichotomy between dynamism and stasis that explains a great deal of modern society and many trends that have become all the more apparent in the years since she wrote it. She's influenced the work that nearly every classical liberal working today does. Today, we're going to be talking about her book, The Fabric of Civilization. I have to tell you, it's fascinating. If you read it, you can learn how cutting edge technology may soon result in commercially marketed silk made from yeast, how indigo gets produced, and it smells pretty bad, and the complicated chemical science between chemicals behind high tech sportswear. There's also just a lot of interesting stuff. Do you know that unraveled the clothes you're wearing right now would probably stretch 20 or more miles? The, the yarn in it, a large fabric tarp, would stretch from Washington DC to Detroit if unraveled. But the Puritans mandated yarn spinning and would penalize houses that didn't meet yarn quotas. This book is a really deep dive on some technological issues and even includes some diagrams. I've looked at them and I still don't quite understand everything about how looms and things work, but it's a lot more. It shows the civilizational impact of textiles and the way they form just about everything. Many of the early Greek civilizations were what she calls textile superpowers. I, I also wasn't fully appreciative myself of the enormous amount of labor needed to make textiles before industrialization. E even where one thinks they might know the history, this is still an illuminating book. Most people who have taken an industrial history course um, or a labor history course learn that industrialization began with textile mills, water-driven ones in the United Kingdom. Not really, I found out from this book. Industrial textile production actually began in Italy about a century before. This is a fascinating, illuminating book. We'll be giving away some copies, but you should support the book and buy a copy. I'm pleased to introduce the author, Virginia, for a conversation with R Street's technology policy director, Wayne Brown. Wayne, who runs our tech program, is a star member of our team. He comes to us from a job as president of the Innovation Defense Foundation and spent more than two decades before that at FreedomWorks and its predecessor organizations. He's one of the most influential economists working on technology in Washington, DC today. I'm pleased to call him a colleague and proud to call him a friend. Wayne, over to you. Thank you, Eli. And, and thank you, Virginia, for, for joining us today, because I, I think you've put out a, a, a marvelous book. It, it's, as Eli said, it's got a, a lot of interesting uh, topics in there. And you touch on things that, that go well beyond uh, what's happening in, in the textile world. I think you get to the bigger questions of uh, progress overall and how do, how do we innovate? How do we... Uh, how do we progress as a civilization? And uh, I, I, I encourage everybody to, to take a look at the book because it, it, it's a fun read and it has a lot of uh, useful information in it. Now, just to sort of kick things off, you know, one of the topics uh, that's really popular today is tech clash and these efforts to break up America's tech companies. But these debates seem to be very narrowly focused on what technology is and what progress is. And it ignores a much broader sweep of, of innovation that occurs throughout the economy. And much of the arguments I hear don't sound so different from earlier debates about an earlier technology. So the, the history of tech, textiles in particular seems rife with these examples of, of tech clash over the years, including the, the most famous, the Luddite Rebellion. So, so how would you describe these parallels between today's tech clash and the earlier hostilities towards innovation? In general, uh, the, there are a number of examples, and the Luddites are actually a pretty late example of cases where you have disruptive technologies 
that cost people their jobs, absolutely, uh, that are beneficial for the greater society and beneficial for consumers uh, and, and beneficial for other workers, but upset the existing order. And uh, one of them that Eli kind of alluded to in his uh, introduction is the one that launched the Industrial Revolution. So this is before the Luddites. In the late 18th century, spinning was a huge bottleneck in production of textiles because you need enormous amounts of thread or yarn to weave anything. I mean, in, in a 22 inch square bandana, there's a mile and a half of the yarn. And in the pre-industrial world where the fastest and best cotton spinners in the world were Indians using the charka, and, uh, they would have taken a hundred hours to spin enough I mean, I'm sorry, they would have taken 24 hours to spin enough uh, thread for a bandana. They would have taken 100 hours to spin enough thread to make a pair of jeans. Uh, and that's a lot of work for one thing. And, and in a world where it's not just, you know, we think of textiles in terms of clothes, but they're not just clothes. They're blankets, they're bandages, they're tents, they're sails, they're sacks. I mean, nowadays, a lot of things that we do with plastics uh, back in the 18th century would have been using textiles. Or um, So overcoming that shortage of thread and uh, the very, very low productivity of even extremely adept spinners was a huge step forward. But it put a lot of people out of work because a lot of people made their living spinning. Now, working in the new spinning mills, which by our standards were horrible places to work with very low wages, but they paid better than the previous, than women spinning at home were making. Um, but one of the results of that was that, well, one was a tech lash. You had people objecting to what were called patent machines because there were patents involved. Um, but mostly they were sort of objecting to the technological disruption of their way of life and of their jobs. So this is in the late 18th century. Fast forward to the 19th century, early 19th century, and that's when the Luddites come in. So now you're looking at power looms. And the irony there is that the Luddites were weavers whose jobs had been made particularly lucrative. I mean, you know, by the standards of the day, by the earlier machines that made thread plentiful. And one of the things that I think a lot of technology people uh, in the contemporary use of, of don't realize is just because you're on top today does not make you a superior mm -hmm. human being. It just <laughs> means you were lucky to live at the time that your job was on top. <laughs> uh, because one thing that you see throughout the history of textiles is kind of fortune's wheel. People or places that are very, uh, very prosperous at one point in the technological cycle, technology changes or patterns of trade change or even tastes change and the world moves on and people are are disrupted mm -hmm. and the if if your response to that is to try to prevent it um you end up with a poorer society in general or you end up with massive uh massive disobedience i mean there are there are wild cases of, of protectionism in some very extreme forms uh, where you just have people flouting the law. I mean, it's, it's interesting because you, you, know, you, you talk about the, the, the wheel of fortune and, and, and how these technologies are, which may seem most profound today, suddenly disappear. In fact, you start your book with a, a quote that I, I really liked and it says, the most pr profound technologies are those that disappear. They weave themselves into the fabric of everyday life until they're indistinguishable from it. And I think this is Mark Weiser talking about computers, 
But this is clearly what's happened um, in textiles and other industries before. And I was wondering if you just give some examples of the things we may be taking for granted about textiles um, and the profound leaps that they've helped society make. I mean, you, you talked about um, going from the, from the, the, the spinning wheel to other technologies in, in order to generate yarn, you had the spindle. Can you talk a, a little about how sort of pervasive these things have become? And they literally have disappeared in, into, into society and in, they're actually, they're in their, our language, they're, they're everywhere around us, but we just don't think of them as those profound innovations anymore. Right. So. So Mark Weiser wrote this, this quote is from an article he wrote in 1991 about ubiquitous computing, where he also uses the metaphor of seamlessness. And I love the quote because I love it because it's true. It's something I've long observed uh, that the most important technologies or innovations are those that we immediately cease to notice because they become, so I, I actually had a quote to that effect on a Starbucks quote, the cup back in the early 2000s. Um, uh, so I love the, the truth of it. And I also love what he's doing. I don't even think he realizes, although maybe he does, that he's woven these weaving metaphors into the, uh, the, the sentence. And the word technology and the word textiles come from the same Indo-European root text, which meant to weave. Uh, so, and, and this is not just in English or even in Indo-European based languages you find similar uh, metaphors or, or, or linguistic connections in Chinese, in indigenous Latin American languages. Uh, making cloth is one of humanity's most important technological activities, productive activities. Um, so if you, if you think about, let's, let's take something that's really recent, that is in the last, 20 years or so. If you'll remember back to when um, uh, business casual became a thing and a lot of guys started wearing khaki pants mm -hmm. to work. And one of the amazing things about these khaki pants was that they were extremely wrinkle resistant. That was a new thing that <laughs> happened to be, uh, there was a, a, a finish, a, a chemical application to the cloth uh, before it was cut and sewn in, into pants that made these clothes wrinkle resistance. And they and this happened to coincide with a time when people were you know, changing what they wore to work in many cases, maybe not so much in DC, but uh, certainly <laughs> <laughs> elsewhere. And, and so that's something really recent. That's something most people don't even know about, don't even think about. Um, a, a lot of the recent innovations in textiles uh, started in outerwear for, you know, outdoor activities and then filtered down into everyday life so that your jacket is much more water resistant and yet it breathes than it would have been in the past or your t-shirt is more likely to wick your sweat. Uh, there's been a, a I, I wrote an article a few years ago uh, investigating something that I'd been wondering for a long time, which is why kids stuffed animals are so much softer than they were when I was a kid in the 60s. <laughs> and, and this had puzzled me ever since, you know, I started to have nieces and nephews who are now all grown in, in college or later. Uh, and, and the reason is uh, microfibers, which were developed the polyester we knew and hated in the 70s became better and better and better. And, and these are a key innovation to uh, all kinds of textiles, including all these uh, activewear kinds of wicking and uh, mm -hmm. textiles we have. So, so there's been a lot of incremental progress that continues to this day. And today, a lot of people are looking at ways of in dealing with the environmental footprint that textiles have. But we, unless you're in the industry, you don't even know about them because textiles are so abundant and so cheap and so good uh, that we can, most of us can afford to ignore them. And this is of course, building on thousands and thousands of years of innovation, some of it incremental, some of it massive leaps like the development of spinning machines. 
Yeah, and, and that's a, that sort of brings me to a, another question that is, you know, today we almost take for granted that, you know, the textiles are, you know, they're retail things that we go to buy for, for clothing or for bed sheets or, or, or what have you. But over time and historically, they have actually a, a much more vital role than we actually recognize. Um, for instance, I, I think you, may, you take the example of Viking warships and, you know, building the, the sails to keep them at war was a tremendous undertaking. Uh, I, I think you said it actually took more to, to build the sails and actually uh, build the ship itself. And to keep the, to, as for the Vikings to keep themselves as a superpower, it was, it's almost as if the, the sails of their time were as important as the steel in, industry in our time. So, so how important are textiles? How do you, you know, think beyond the the, the, the clothing and the retail things that, that we do with them? Right. Well, well, partly you just have to, if if you start to think about textiles, and, and this is in the contemporary sense, and you start to say, okay, where are the textiles in my life? Where are the textiles in this room? You'll start to notice things that you never thought about being textiles, like for example, duct tape. Duct tape, which you know can fix anything, uh, is is a textile-based tape, and in fact, nowadays it's ducked with a T tape, but it was originally duck with a K tape, and that's because duck with a K was a type of canvas, and the word comes from it has nothing to do with quacking waterfowl. It comes from a Dutch word, uh, but it was the canvas that made sails. And you can go back into the congressional record and you can find, you know, debates about military procurement of duck uh, for the US Navy. And this is after the industrial revolution. This would have been woven on power looms using industrially spun materials. So that great expansion of trade and colonization and all these things that happened in the late 18th and 19th century, the British Navy, partly that is enabled by sales being much easier to get. Um, but as you say, uh, the, a Viking sale from start to finish, from uh, getting the wool off the sheep to cleaning it, spinning it, weaving it, and you know those stripes on the the viking sails uh which look fearsome but they are also a there's a technological reason behind them which is the loom is only so wide so you have to sew these panels together to make this sail well then why don't you every other one you could dye red and you could make it look more scary or something <laughs> uh or just you know more more uh visible um yeah. so so we have all of that process took longer than making the ship, including cutting down the trees, finishing the logs, all of that stuff. Um, but for two reasons, we tend to forget that um, when we look at history. One is that the textiles are lost. So we have very few old sails. Um, I did a Thanksgiving article for uh, USA Today about textiles and Thanksgiving, and I wanted to know about the Mayflower sales. And there's only one example of sales from that era that have survived, uh, which is the Vasa, which was a, uh, a Swedish ship that sank in, <laughs> it never got out of the harbor. Uh, and and, they, and the uh, sales were part of the recovery. They, they, they have pieces of the sales. Uh, but so we've lost, we've actually physically lost a lot of textiles. And that's definitely true if you go back to uh, very early history. There are only a few places in the world where we have archaeological textiles uh, because of the exact, mostly they're dry places. Uh, they're mm -hmm. textiles from Peru, they're textiles from the Middle East and uh, uh, Xinjia and, and in Northwest China, um, and and then there are a few where you had bogs in Europe where there was anaerobic. Uh, so that's one reason. And the other reason is that it is women's work, not entirely. It gets overstated as, as how 
gendered textile production was, but certainly spinning was women's work. And there's a tendency, particularly the farther and farther we get from the Industrial Revolution, to not pay attention to that. Yeah, that, that I mean, that's an interesting point. And, and you know, uh, I think expanding the textile output over time, it relied on the ability to produce cloth you know, more cheaply and more efficiently. And you, you start with the, the important role that women played in spinning thread and how, how big a part of their day-to-day -day life that was for almost all women in, in, in all economies, not just Europe, but around the world. Right, yeah. So, so how did we go from the, the spinning wheels to the looms to finally the industrial revolution that we have today? And also, I mean, do women still play a role throughout history as, as significant in, in, the, uh, in the textile world? Well, one of the things that is certainly the case in, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, there is a lot of employment of women and children in uh, the early spinning mills. And in labor history, this is often seen as like a terrible thing and they're being exploited because they're cheap. And, you know, that's not entirely wrong, but it's also a continuation of what they were doing before, only it's now in an industrial context. And I mean, I, want, I don't want to exaggerate how uh, female specific this is, because for example, weaving in some cultures, like in China, it was a quintessentially female thing, although not all the weavers in China were women. Uh, in other places, like in Europe, depending on the guild restrictions, men wove, women wove, both wove or men were officially in the guild, but then their wives and daughters would be in the guild. Uh, so there, there was that sort of thing. Um, and dyeing also varied with, with the culture. Um, and this, I think that this continues to some degree to this day. I mean, nowadays textile production is definitely, you know, men and women do it and do it all around the world. Um, but I think, because cloth has so much and cloth production traditionally has been such a great part of women's lives, women are perhaps more drawn to thinking about it or uh, engaging in it as a hobby, that sort of thing when they don't have to. I mean, I, I learned to weave uh, when I was researching the book and unlike I learned to spin. I, I, I did a little spinning and I was terrible at it. I decided this is not going to be hobby, but I did become a sort of hobby weaver. And the weaving guild, which is not the old kind of guild, it's just a group uh, that I'm in, is predominantly female. Um, although there are some, you know, men who, who weave as well. It, it's, it's not, there's nothing particularly female about the activity. In fact, it's very sort of mathematical and involves a lot of three-dimensional thinking that you might think is quintessentially if you you know engage in stereotypes quintessentially male but but anyway now you you make that point in in your book and I, I think it's fascinating that you say you know some of the the first punch cards that we've used for for automation were actually came out of the the you know textile world and textile industry and and the fact that you know the use of prime numbers and, and the use of, of applied math was something that, that probably was a significant part of this industry and maybe more so than other industries just because of the complexities of building patterns on, on these giant looms. Yes, particularly if you are making patterns, you have to think a lot about ratios and uh, relationships between numbers and because you've got to turn these these threads into something two-dimensional. And so you can go back to the ancient Greeks and their uh, looms, which were vertical, uh, called, they're called warp-weighted looms because the, the, the warp threads, the ones that are held in tension were vertical and hung and were secured at the bottom by just attaching something heavy to hold them in tension. Um, if you were weaving on one of those looms, you had to think about the ratios of the um, the warp threads, especially if you were trying to create a pattern. And it has been speculated, I talk about this, uh, that what has been called the granddaddy of all algorithms, which is division by subtraction, may have come out of this activity, which was 
pervasive throughout Greek culture. Even people who didn't themselves weave knew about weaving. Um, and, and basically that's, you have a big number and a little number and you keep subtracting the little number from the big number until you either have a remainder or you have zero. And this is an algorithm that's used in computing. Uh, and it is uh, in, it first appears in Euclid's, uh, in Euclid's elements in the arithmetic section of that, which date before Euclid. And the thinking is that this is in fact something that weavers do when they are measuring out, uh, trying to decide if they've got something divisible by the number of the, the number of threads that they need to make a pattern, they'll take from either side of the loom and you know keep subtracting until they either end up with a remainder or zero, and then they can add threads uh, uh, to the edge to make it come out right. And I know weavers who do this, and they've read the book and say, "Wow, I, I never thought I, was, you know, I thought I was just lazy." Uh, but there is this kind of profound mathematical quality to the making of cloth, whether you're talking about weaving or knitting, uh, in the same way that there is a profound mathematical quality to uh, to music. Uh, there, it's about pattern. It's about symmetries. Uh, if you look at a, a lot of the uh, tr indigenous weaving traditions around the world, they're very much, for example, in the Andes, they play a lot with remembering patterns by remembering the relationships of very symmetrical op operations. Um, and of course, you mentioned the thing that I think most technology people know today, which is J Joseph Marie Jacquard invented this gadget that could select uh, loom threads to make a pattern by using punch cards. And it's actually a super complex mechanism that is hard to explain. I think that was one of those diagrams that <laughs> I try to explain in the book and it's really hard, uh, but it, and it was at the edge of sort of mechanical uh, complexity in that era. Um, but long before that, people around the world were figuring out ways to record and reproduce complicated one zero patterns, which is what weaving patterns are. Um, and, and so this is something that has been part of the human experience, this, this manipulating binary patterns for thousands of years. That's, I mean, that brings up sort of an interesting point. And, and uh, I know in, in the book, you talk, you touch on it a, a little bit, but, uh, and you had talked about patent looms where obviously there's patents involved, but at the same time in your book, you, you talk about people who develop catalogs that they, they want to share with people that did, or develop technologies. How much, was there sort of an open source versus patent sort of evolution that, that occurred in, in the textile world? Well, it's a little, it's, it's, so there's a trade secret versus open source first. Uh, that is through most of history, in part for practical reasons, in part for economic competition reasons, uh, knowledge of how to do things, whether it's weaving patterns or dye recipes, was passed down from master to apprentice uh, um, by hands-on instruction. Uh, but when you started to have book publishing, the printing press, and you get into the 16th century, and the idea of making a dye recipe book becomes an entrepreneurial opportunity. And we have in the 16th century, the first, it's, it's very much like a, a, a very old cookbook. There's no precise, you know, there's no precise temperatures or pH measurements. And even timekeeping is often like the amount of time it takes to say for our fathers or things like that, as opposed to, you know, 15 minutes or whatever. Um, but you start to have people writing down what used to be trade secrets and sharing them. Um, and then that allows the dispersion of knowledge. And then, uh, and then a century later, you have the first weaving manual. Uh, and there it's very much uh, an idealistic kind of open source idea of uh, um, the, the a, a weaver who is frustrated that people say that, you know, in my, they have to be importing these fancy tablecloths because they say people around here can't make them. Uh, but 
that's because people who know how to make them hoard the knowledge. And so I'm going to write this book that has instructions on how to make the patterns. And in order to do that, he also had to come up with a notation, just like you have to come up with musical notation, uh, a, a way of recording weaving patterns, which is with a few except with a few refinements used to this day uh, for recording weaving patterns. So there's definitely this this idea that if you share knowledge, you can uh, get more you know, more advancement. And that starts to be an idea in the 16th and 17th century and is part of what uh, the economic historian Joel, Joel Mokir calls the industrial enlightenment, which is this coming together of science in the sort of high hat versions and artisanal knowledge where the two things get get shared and cross fertilize each other in productive ways. Uh, so that's an element of it. Um, in terms of the patent machines, that was an idea uh, that was an objection to patenting uh, machines, which was a privilege granted by the British Crown to certain inventions, um, as opposed to just being able to, you know, build your own. Um, and there is, okay. you know, there's a tension between that. And then the, the other thing is there's a tremendous amount of industrial espionage. So, you know, how did spinning mills come to the United States? They came because a guy named Samuel Slater, who had these patent machines in his head, immigrated to Rhode Island and built them. Uh, and the patent couldn't reach that way. I couldn't reach over uh, that way. So, uh, you know, the kind of all pervasive international kind of protection for intellectual property that we talk about today is really not the part, uh, not really the history that gives us the advances in textiles. The one exception to some degree is chemistry and dyeing. But even there, um, in the early dye patents, they would just be national. So for example, um, William Perkin, who developed the first synthetic dye, Mauve, um, he had the British patent and he built a business on that. And other people were coming up with other dye formulas uh, along the way. But in France, other people produced it. In Germany, other people produced it. They, those, those British patents didn't carry over to those other countries. Uh, it's fascinating. I mean, it does show sort of the, the international perspective and, and of the textile industry and, and how it impacted world trade and actually patterns of trade across the, the, the globe. And, and one a great example you bring up in your book is Calico. Um, it has a lot of implications for trade as well as stories of protectionism. Can you talk a little bit about what you know, it was really a disruptive technology and, and how did Calico uh, come to Europe and what impact did it have in Europe? Right, so Calico, you can see an example behind me. This is the contemporary version that I uh, bought in India, but Calico is a word that is used to refer to Indian cotton prints. Uh, the cotton was very finely woven, a uh, very finely spun, uh, the Indian spinners were the best in the world at spinning cotton. Uh, it and the dye technology was quite advanced. I mean, it was a it was a trial and error kind of recipe technology. It wasn't deep chemical understanding, but the, the colors were very color fast. You could wash and dry them, so there was this great fabric that was very different from the wools, silks, and linens that were known in Europe. Uh, and it came into Europe. It started in the 16th century in Portugal, but it really had its heyday in the 17th and 18th century with the development of the various East India companies, the French, mm -hmm. British, and Dutch East India companies, which would bring these textiles from India. And they were not, you know, people loved them. They, they were they went wild for them. I mean, this is a 200 year long fashion craze um, because they were so different and so great. Uh, they were so comfortable, easy to wash, easy to dry. 
they were available at every kind of price point. You could have a very elaborate uh, hand painted gown for court, or you could have, a, you know, a, a, a serving maid could have buy a handkerchief, sort of the, the equivalent of a bandana. Um, but they were very, very disruptive to the existing industries uh, in they in Britain, they threatened the wool industry, which was a huge, important industry, and also linen. Uh, in France, they threatened those industries, but also, and very importantly, the silk industry, which was the luxury fiber and was the luxury industry and was the height of fashion. And Lyon was the capital for all of Europe. Um, but you know these ladies wanted to wear calicos at court or indians they were called in france so what happened was a protectionist backlash even though these various east india companies were chartered and sort of quasi-governmental um they didn't have as much clout and certainly the consumers didn't so in britain you got uh the calico acts which restricted the importation of calico. So you couldn't bring it into the mother country. You could bring it to the American colonies uh, in North America or in the Caribbean, but you couldn't sell it in, in the mother country. Uh, you could, however, produce competitors. You could do printing, you could, uh, um, but in France, they really went to extremes to protect the silk industry and other industries. They basically treated calicos the way the United States treats cocaine. That is, or, or and to some degree, I sometimes say as the way the United States treated cocaine in the 1980s, because it's not like people weren't using them. Uh, and in fact, people were even wearing them at court. Uh, but they, they made it a crime with quite severe penalties uh, to own, import, where any not only imported Indian prints, but any imported cotton, even plain with no prints, and e any prints, even if they were made in France by French companies on French cloth. So there's this extreme prohibition uh, for protection, you know, for protectionist reasons. So to us, it seems kind of strange because we don't think of protectionism as a and prohibition as being together. We think of prohibition as being sort of moral or about uh, other kinds of social uh, dysfunctions. Um, and it lasted for 73 years. And the thing is, there were a million ways around it because France was surrounded by places where it was legal. I mean, you could bring them in from Switzerland. There were uh, Savoy, various little principalities. And in fact, because the French East India Company also wanted to sell them, you could actually buy them at auction in Marseille, but you had to s pretend that you were going to take them to Africa to trade for slaves, which was something that people did. And that was OK. Uh, but then you could turn around and sell them in France. So there was this massive smuggling, massive uh, flouting of the law. And some of the early classical liberal writings are people saying, you know, not only does this not work, it's really unjust. Uh, sending people to the galleys or uh, uh, executing them because they are engaged in this smuggling uh, in order to protect the fortunes of a particular industry. This is just wrong. And there's nothing enlightened about this. And we pretend we're such an enlightened nation. So eventually it was repealed. Um, and it was replaced with something we would recognize as protectionism. That is a 25% tax. And there was still a lot of smuggling, but it was a little bit less risky. And it was easier to get the legal stuff. And once you were able to import plain uh, Indian cotton, then uh, French entrepreneurs developed their own printing technology, which was based on copper plates coming sort of out of book printing, very different from the Indian printing and uh, the kinds of uh, fabrics that are called toiles that are that are inspired by uh, Chinese porcelain. They have like little scenes often in blue or other pastels on a, a light colored background. 
I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to, to, to hear these stories. And, and, and clearly, it, their prohibition lasted far longer than our prohibition on alcohol. It, it went for oh, a number yeah. of years. And, um, and why, I mean, with that risk, was it totally unenforceable? Or, or why, why were people taking the risk of going ahead and, and flaunting the law so, so frequently? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, they really, really loved these uh, fabrics. They were better than a lot of the alternatives. And of course, just as with drug prohibition, the law was kind of unevenly enforced. Uh, you know, you could get away with it a lot of times, but other times they would decide they're going to have a crackdown and they would start, you know, they'd look in the windows and see somebody had a, a a chair with a calico print on it and they would come in and arrest them and people could be detained without trial. So it, it was, it was, they must it was have prestige. <laughs> it was prestige. It was uh, convenience. Uh, it, it is amazing. It really is amazing. That is, I mean, I, we've got a little bit more time and um, what I want to do is, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave you with a, one quick question, and then um, I want to open it up to the, to the audience for uh, uh, Q&A, and hopefully uh, everybody can use the, the Q&A uh, part of the Zoom, uh, the link down below your, your screen there. And ideally, we, we like economic incentives here at R Street, so um, our, what we're going to do is offer free copies of Virginia Prostrell's book, for those questions that we, that we use uh, in, 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 this, in this book review. Um, so um, please feel free to enter your, your questions in the Q&A. And I, I think we'll have, we'll send you the book and I think Virginia is going to also assign a book plate that we can include with it. So, so uh, please put your thinking caps on and come up with some good questions. Um, I've got a ton more, but I'll, I'll just leave you with <laughs> where the, where's the, the, the future going? I mean, we, there's, Textiles are getting very, very advanced. And I, I know here in the States, we have something almost like a DARPA for fabrics and uh, they're doing some interesting things. If you could maybe guess a little bit about the future. Yeah, so the the group you referred to, which is called a FOA, is its acronym is at MIT. I mean, it's actually, it's headquartered at MIT, but there, it's a consortium of a lot of different universities, companies, uh, defense elements. And their, their main thrust is looking for ways to put uh, computing into threads and also potentially batteries and, and things like that. Um, and, and they've made great progress, um, but it's hard because essentially what they're doing is they're using technologies that are kind of give you fiber optics. Uh, I mean, if in terms of things that people are familiar with, you get these very thin uh, threads and, and it's amazing. They have computer chips in them. It's amazing how uh, small the chips are, um, but they are still difficult to weave or uh, knit into garments or other things because they don't, stretch and bend uh, so that's the, that's the frontier there and the, there's a lot of interesting things going on you uh, either you or Eli mentioned uh, the idea of bioengineering um, silk or polymer uh, protein polymers uh, using yeast which is being done by a venture capital based uh, company out in the Bay Area called Bolt Threads uh, they have they have sort of pivoted to emphasizing their uh, leather substitute, which is based on mushroom technologies, but I think eventually we will see uh, this idea of bioengineering protein polymers as opposed to the kinds of polymers that we're used to, because you can do, you could potentially, it's not just that you could have sort of vegan silk for people who care about that, but that you could tune the characteristics of the fiber the same way you tune uh, things like polyester microfibers only with much many more ranges of possibility so that's a, a, a down the road and then the thing that's happening now and that you know I can I can say is is already a big deal and getting bigger and bigger deal is 3d knitting 
uh, driven by computer programming and uh, 3D knitting has been around, well, at some levels has been around forever, but it, it this sort of computerized uh, 3D knitting where you can make a sweater, it has no seams uh, or, uh, it's been around for several decades, but it's gotten better and better, and the software has gotten better and better, and now it's becoming something that is increasingly used, so that, for example, you can make a sneaker, and you can program it so that not only do you get the aesthetics you want, but you have a different thickness in the arch, a different thickness in the heel, you have different stitches where the the shoelaces are going to go and eventually you get this one piece, which you can then just fold together and, and, and glue a little bit and put the rubber sole on and you've got a shoe. And the idea, uh, the value of this is that it allows uh, manufacturers or apparel companies to keep their inventories in the thread rather than in the finished goods. So it's more flexible. Uh, you don't end up with as much unsold stock you can potentially do it closer to the customer and it's part also of this whole uh, I love weaving but uh, nowadays knitting is kicking its butt because <laughs> for the first time partly that's the comfort revolution knitting is stretchy you get the yoga pants the athleisure and partly it's because the setup time is much less you can change uh, the patterns, you can change the uh, the threads that you're using, the colors much faster than you can on a loom. Okay, great. Well, that's, um, let's move to some questions here. And and this one, you know, it, you know, your book covers so much uh, and, and I did want to touch on this, but but t can you talk about the Incan, Incan's use of, and I don't know, QP, I don't know. Kipu. 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 Okay. So the Kipu were, um, strings basically uh collections of strings that were knotted knotted cords that the incas used as record keeping um and they are very mysterious they've they've been hard to crack it, it's hard to believe that something that was understood as recently as the you know as 1500 um has been completely lost, but people have been working on decoding and there've been some advances. Uh, they're starting to understand there was a, an undergraduate, I think, who, who made a big advance a few years ago. Um, I don't write about Kipu in the book, uh, but it's definitely an example of something that's very true about the Incan culture, which it was very much a cloth and uh, textile and, thread or cord based culture even more than many others it was really really important and incan textiles are amazing i mean they are um the 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 fineness of the spinning the vividness of the dyes uh even on cotton which is hard to dye uh is extraordinary and even the uh the Incan traditions today, I mean, people are still weaving amazing things in, in the highlands uh, in Peru. And there's also, uh, Peru was the first, one of the first places in the world where cotton was cultivated and, and made into a cultivated species. And also thanks to some of the dry areas, it's one of the places where we have the earliest textiles uh, that, are, that are preserved, oh, so okay. yeah. Okay, and we have another question here, um, and it, I think it has to do with sort of the envir environmental footprint of the industry. And uh, it's in recent years, it's remarked that natural fiber production, particularly cotton, is very pollute polluting. Is the production of artificial fibers really uh, that much cleaner? <laughs> well, that's a that's a very debatable question. Um, you know, it partly depends on what you're interested in measuring. I mean, cotton takes a lot of water. It takes, uh, it takes a lot of uh, pesticides and herbicides. I mean, one, one way that you're able to um, use mechanical harvesting is by really reducing any other kinds of plant matter that might be in the, in the row. Um, interestingly, uh, the, the evil GMO cotton tends to be a little less environmentally uh, 
impactful to use a horrible word, but uh, it has fewer spill spillovers. Um, I think the real issue, uh, if you're thinking about the environmental impact of textile production, it is not this fiber is better than that fiber or synthetic dyes are bad or anything like that. It's just a matter of scale. And it's, it's because we have so many textiles and so that it's, it, it, you can improve processes. And certainly I write about this in, in the context of dyeing. A lot of the, if you're concerned about the environmental impact, uh, you shouldn't worry so much about thinking about chemical dyes. It's all chemicals. Uh, you should think about how exactly you economize on the amount of water that's used, how you uh, avoid effluent, all of those kinds of things. It's a very precise kind of process engineering issues. And the same things are true in agriculture. Um, it, it's, it's, and, you know, for that matter, in, in, uh, production of synthetic fibers and disposal of synthetic fibers. But I think there is a lot of emphasis nowadays in the textile industry um, and thinking about environmental impact. And a lot of people who are in other fields of science come and are worrying about that are drawn to textiles because it's a high leverage point. Um, and so but but I guess my message is it's not about this is good and that's bad. It's about scale. It's anything that is at this scale is going to have an impact on the environment. Okay, great, thanks. And uh, uh, another question that that, that uh, somebody has here is, what do you see as the most disruptive technology in the in the textile world? The most disruptive. I assume they mean today, uh, not historically. Um, I think that this, this is a tough question. It, it sort of depends on the time frame. So I think that looking long term, or you know, twenty years from now, the most disruptive technology we might look back and say it was these bioengineered fibers. Um, uh, if you really can get a pro. pro uh, a set of protein polymers available that gives you, that will dramatically disrupt uh, the textile industry at, at its very source. Uh, nowadays, I think it's the potential to take this 3D knitting that I talked about. And uh, one person that I talked to said, it's kind of at the, the stage that 3D printing was at uh, maybe 15 years ago. So it has a potential to change the scale necessary uh, to make it, to change the relationship between designers and manufacturers. Uh, but there are a lot of issues there about software compatibility, proprietary system versus open source. Uh, there are some issues there, um, but I, there are also some really cool, interesting things where, um, techniques and software developed originally for animation to make cloth look realistic on screen uh, have, have now been are now being used uh, to simulate the behavior of actual specific this thread from this manufacturer if you make it into this form how will it look uh, so you have a lot of potential there and and some of that might change the scale and the locations and other things that we think of in terms of disruption. Great, thanks. And we got a couple more here and then I, I think we're getting close to the hour here. But um, one, one question here is, uh, is being that textiles replace animal skins, are textiles primary, primarily tr uh, tremendous devices, advances for civilization, including leading up to the industrial revolution? I know we talked a little bit about this, but you do go through the whole history of uh, how this happened and it's a great story, so. Yeah, so textiles, sure, they're, you know, they're major technology, the, the beginning of them. Uh, there is, I, I don't write about this in the book, but the speculation from, uh, there, there's a scholar called Ian Gilligan, who's in Australia, who studied the history of clothes and his, 
basically his argument is that this is a climate change argument that when when the glaciers receded and people um, uh, were in warmer warming climates they had gotten used to wearing animal skins uh, but animal skins are very sweaty they don't breathe and it's fine if you're in the arctic but if you're in even you know northern europe uh as it is today you don't want to be wearing animal skins but people had already gotten used to wearing clothes and so that's was the root of the invention of textiles right uh, and then i guess maybe uh one final question here is um and this this it's an interesting question on, on some of the the sort of prohibitions on, on textiles around the world is just a number of U.S. historical societies have printed textiles used for clothing, bed hangings, and so forth. And these have been identified as Indian textiles imported despite the British laws against importation. How did the early colonists circumvent these laws? Actually, it was not illegal to import them in the American colonies. It was illegal to import them in Great Britain proper. So one reason that British manufacturers were so frustrated uh, with their inability to spin cotton thread and manufacture uh, good calicos, homegrown calicos, was that they were not getting that North American market. Okay, great. Well, I, I think we are sort of hitting the hour. There, there's actually one question, um, actually from George Selgin, and he's just asking if you if you've read Eduardo Nisi's 2011 book, The Story of My People. I have read that book and it is a remarkable book because it was, it just shows if you're a high hat literary writer, you could get away with sounding like Pat Buchanan and get praised for it. <laughs> or Donald Trump. I mean, it's basically this, you know, super, as I would say in the future and its enemies, stasis uh, kind of argument that it's terrible that uh, Italy faced uh, the Italian, um, textile manufacturers faced international competition. Great. Okay, well, we, we, we have hit three o'clock. So I, I want to thank everybody for, for uh, dialing into our, our conversation here in Virginia. Thank you. You did a, a great job of des describing a pretty complex uh, industry throughout its civilization. So, so uh, thank you again. And uh, as I said, we, we, did, we do have the names of the questions that we asked and we will be sending uh, copies of the book to, to you folks. So once again, thank you, everybody, and uh, stay tuned for our Sweets uh, events in the future. Okay. So I think we're, I, I think yeah. we're, so we're, is it just back to us? Just looking at the questions in case, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I did travel a lot overseas. <laughs> I, yeah, I saw your stories about Laos and uh, some. Well, I actually, the interesting thing about the Lao Loom is I actually saw that in China, but I, w I went to this very useful conference in, in China called World of Looms. So it brought, <laughs> it brought a bunch of different people from different parts of the world. To, uh, so I was able to see a lot in one place. Great. All right. Great. All thank right. you. Well, thanks. Thanks again. And uh, I'll, I'll be in touch about the book plates. and. and, and okay, some... great. Sure. Talk to All you. Right. All right. Thank thanks you. very much for setting this up. Oh, this is great. Thank you. All right. Bye bye.